Okay, we should have the Zoom uh, recording on as a backup now as well. Thank you, Peter. So the second goal, once we've got our tidy time series data structured as a tibble, we'll be visualizing those patterns using various time series specific plots, and that's to identify common patterns like trend, seasonality, and a few other patterns. Then in the second group, uh, we'll be producing modeling using some common statistical models, and we'll produce forecasts from them as well. So I think we're looking at, I think it was seven different models, maybe eight different models. So there's quite a lot to get through in the second hour of today. And finally, we need to identify which of these many models are the most accurate for forecasting. And for this, we'll use residual diagnostics and accuracy evaluation metrics. So that'll be our third and final hour of the day. So a few expectations. I don't feel the need to go through this because there is an existing code of conduct. But if you do have any relevant questions about something I'm talking about, feel free to interrupt, put something in the chat, and I'll try to answer it uh, in a timely fashion. If you have some less relevant questions or just questions about me and my work or anything else about forecasting, we have a few breaks in between the hours uh, where you can ask that as well. Uh, as usual, please be kind and respectful, make some mistakes, put, um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there, answer the questions, and I think making errors is the best way to learn. And it's pretty low uh, risk errors to make in this session today. So this workshop's about tidy time series analysis, and the emphasis here is on tidy. Uh, you might have seen or heard of uh, these packages before, perhaps just the tidyverse, uh, but we'll be using these packages today to analyze time series data. And as mentioned before, uh, if you haven't yet, you should install them all using FPP3, install.packages, FPP3. Uh, once again, I've just put in the link to the workshop website in the chat, which also provides this instruction and will give you access to the slides as needed. Now, there's a difference here between the forecast package, which you might also have heard of, and the fable package. The forecast package is built on top of base R and the TS objects, whereas the fable package is built to work with the tidyverse for tidy time series forecasting. So there's a few differences because you would have seen a lot of information if you're looking about forecasting about the forecast package, but perhaps not so much about the fable package. So with the TS objects, TS objects are only capable of representing a single time series, whereas Sybil objects can represent many time series. So forecast is better for single forecasting problems, whereas the Fable package is better at forecasting many different time series. And there's many situations where we'd like to do that, which we'll see today as well. The forecast package is also a little bit limited in the nature of observations, the frequency that they might occur, and the regularity. So it requires them to either be monthly, quarterly, or annually. It can work a little bit with weekly or daily data, but it starts to become problematic for plotting and uh, the exact precision of seasonality. Whereas for Fable, there's no such problem there. It can be irregular of any frequency that you like. The forecast package is built on point forecasts and importantly intervals. This is quite uh, useful and innovative from the forecast package. And the Fable package goes one step further to represent entire forecast distributions. So that from that, you can pull out the point forecasts being mean forecasts, median forecasts. You can pull out the intervals, quantiles, whatever you need from that distribution. And lastly, Fable works well with the tidyverse. So if you're familiar with the tidyverse, you'll be in comfortable familiar hands uh, when you're using the software. Okay, so who's worked with time series data before? If you could just put in the chat briefly, uh, a quick yes or no, have you worked with any time series data in your work before? Okay, a little bit split. Looks about 50-50, maybe a few more no's. That's excellent to see. So we've got a um, quite a lot of different responses here. Now, I'm sure you've all seen time series data before. Time series data is something we work with all the time. Uh, for example, you might be looking at the weather 
and you know the recent weather, you might look at the forecast for the future weather is the most common response I get when I tell people that I do forecasting. They ask, oh, you, you like care about the weather, right? And that unfortunately is a completely different problem uh, compared to the forecast that I tend to produce, which is for business and for uh, government. So here's some examples of time series data that you might have thought about before. Uh, and these are all of different frequencies. So you can see it's sorted at the very top. We have something that happens very infrequently for yearly, the Olympics, going down all the way to the bottom where you might have uh, continuous blood glucose measurements uh, coming through every minute or more frequently than that. And you might have exact transactions of stock market data, or maybe someone's hiring a bike and it will be an event where it is the exact millisecond at which that transaction was occurring. So I tend to work towards the middle here, if not closer down. Uh, so I did quite a lot of work on COVID-19 infections, which came through every day. And uh, I've worked on other projects that are sub daily frequency as well. Generally, the further down you get towards sub daily and more frequently than that, uh, the more complex the patterns that might exist occur. They also tend to be a little bit noisier. When you aggregate over time into quarterly or annual patterns, the uh, patterns that you might find in the data become simpler. Peter's put another few good examples in there, the heart rate, number of step counts throughout the day, and uh, the sleep stats from every minute from a wearable device. They're all great examples where you might find time series data. And I'm finding that uh, as technology has grown, um, especially in the time that I've been doing forecasting, the availability of data, especially time series data, is growing rapidly. So if you haven't yet worked with time series, you might need to work with time series at some point for your research. So just like any data set, time series data can come in all sizes all shapes and sizes, and we can only hope that it's tidy. But if it's not tidy, you can use the existing uh, tidy manipulation tools like TidyR and Reader uh, that you might use for cross-sectional data. Uh, the time series data that we use is of the same long, tidy format. But there's a few special types of variables that we have with time series data, perhaps most uh, intuitively, is that time series data contains a time variable. So we call this the index variable, and we need to have something measured at each time point, and we call these the measurements or the measured variables. Now, if you've got a large data set, for example, you've got multiple patients in a lab, you might have an identifying key variable, we call this the key variables, uh, which identifies one patient from another patient. So here's our first look at the Sybil data format. Sybil is for a time series tibble, TS for time series, and Sybil, tibble for, time, uh, for the data frame, the tidy for data frame, tibble. And a common example that we use a lot is the tourism uh, data set, which is the quarterly number of visitors coming to Australia, uh, to a specific region within a state for a given purpose, be it business travel, holiday travel, visiting friends and relatives or something completely different. So you can see the output here looks pretty familiar. Unlike a tibble, we just have a sibyl with the rows and the columns. And we've got some extra uh, decoration here in the, in the print output. This refers to the frequency of the data. So just like before, when we had many different time series and they had different frequencies of observation every quarter, every four years, etc. Here, the 1Q indicates that the frequency of this data is one quarter. And you can see the time column, the index here, starts from 1998 in quarter one and increments by one quarter in every time step. So quarter one becomes two, quarter three, quarter four into the next year, repeating. You can also see another row that you wouldn't be used to seeing, and this is similar to a group by, if you've done that as an intermediate step for data manipulation. The key variables for this data set 
are region, state, and purpose. You can have many different key variables, but you can only have a single time index. So the interaction between these three variables, region, state, and purpose, help to identify a unique time series. And then the measured variables, the things that we're interested in forecasting or the things that we've observed in each quarter is the number of domestic trips. So there were 135, I think this is in thousands, 135,000 trips to uh, South, Ad uh, South Australia in Adelaide for business purposes in 1998 quarter one. Now this is a very common representation of a time series data set in a tidy format. Even if you didn't have the Sybil format on top of this, this is how you'd usually represent this using a data frame, a tidy data frame. So I've got a bit ahead of myself here in this data set. I did have this as your exercise, but we'll have another uh, opportunity to try this out. So in this data set, which of the columns were the index variables, key variables, and measured variables? We have our index variable being the time column, quarter. The key variables uniquely identify the time series, region, state, and purpose. And finally, the trips, our numerical column here, is the measured variable, something we might like to plot over time, forecast over time, etc. Now, representing time, we saw that we had this nice uh, quarterly layout here for the time column. It's a bit tricky, surprisingly tricky, in fact, to represent time. And it's something that I'll be working a lot on my PhD uh, this year. And if you think about time quite a lot, there's a lot of nuance involved with exactly describing a point in time. We've already talked a little bit about the frequency of an observation, if something occurs every quarter, every year, or every day. But you might also have the granularity, which is the minimum divisible time point that you can have. So you might have the Olympics every four years, but your granularity might be one year. Or you might use a finer granularity and say the Olympics was on exactly this day, but it still happens every four years. So the interaction between frequency and granularity are very closely tied. And granularity is especially important here uh, because if I represented this as it usually is in other uh, raw data sets, which is 1998, first day of the first month, that granularity there is actually shown as days when the granularity of the data is in quarters. I just see Peter's talking about how he often gets uh, hour, minute, second timestamps for a very specific moment in time. And then uh, to thicken it out, he needs to use a different package to change the granularity. That's a great example. So you might have used, uh, say, Lubridate to manipulate this before. You might use flawed date um, and then provide a specific period to modify or group together uh, time. But that helps change the frequency, but not the granularity. So we've got some special tools to help with that. For sub-daily data, you also have to deal with time zones. Uh, you might have calendar effects. Uh, with, when you've got calendars, you've also got leap years. And you may not have heard about this before, but leap seconds are also a thing to be considered at times. Holiday effects are directly tied to calendars, but not just calendars, but where you are in the world. For example, in Australia, uh, today is a public holiday for Victoria, but not for Queensland. So depending, even if you're in the same country, in the same zone, you might have different holidays based on uh, location. And when there's time zones, you also have different uh, points in time. So for me, it's 7.50 a.m. For you, it might be in the evening. and even though this is the exact same absolute time, it's for me, it's Tuesday, but for most of you, it's probably Monday. So thinking about time in how we describe it will be very different between civil time, how we usually look at our clocks and absolute time, the physical time that we're currently in. 
And lastly, you might have time ranges. So for example, the Olympics isn't exactly on just one day or one hour, it's a span of time. So you might want to identify a range of time being from the start till the end of the event. So there's a lot to digest there, but fortunately for us today, we only have a simple set of time representations that we need to think about. And these correspond to uh, the different frequencies or granularities that we want to represent our data with. So we'll be working a lot with quarterly data today, and we've got the special class here, uh, year quarter, to represent the combination of a year and a quarter. Similarly, year month for monthly data, year week for weekly data, and then we can use the existing objects in R, like dates and date times, and integers for years to represent the rest. Okay, so let's get started. I've got some code here that I will try to put in the chat as well. So I want you to try to read in this data set and we're going to prepare the data set into a tidy long format. But importantly here, you'll see the time variable is of the uh, unsuitable class, how you'd normally get it being a date. And then we need to do some manipulation to convert it into a Sybil with the appropriate granularity and identifying the index and key variables. So I'm just gonna open a new script here. Hopefully that's large enough for you to see clearly. Hopefully this data has been deployed successfully. It looks like it has. Okay, so if you read in this data set, uh, you'll see this tibble. I've, my screen's a little bit too narrow for this, but let me just save this as PBS raw, the original data that we've got. Give us a bit more space. Okay, and looking at this data set, you can see it's already in a nice tidy long format. We've got some numerical variables here, scripts and costs, and various drug classifications, uh, the ATC indexes at level one and level two, along with the type of concession, uh, how much subsidy was given by the Australian government. Uh, just a question in the chat. I've just linked to the workshop website. This workshop website contains all of the resources for today. Uh, you can find the slides up the top here. Uh, there are some display related issues with these slides that I didn't realize and I'll get that fixed after today, after the workshop. Okay, so the first step in converting this data that you'd normally find from uh, a database or from a, a file given to you is to set up the data into a tidy long format. Fortunately for us, it already is in that format. But importantly, we need to set the appropriate granularity for my month column. You can see even though it says month, it's in the very common year month day format where I have the year, the month, and even though I'm not using the day because it's a monthly variable, I still have this zero one, and this is a very common pattern, but it's important to set the appropriate granularity because there's an irregular number of days between each month and that causes a problem for forecasting. It is perfectly valid to have data that is occurred exactly on the first day of every month, but that's not what's happening here. It's a total across the entire month. Okay, so with this, we can mutate the month and we're going to convert this into a different granularity, a year month using mutate. So now you can see it's converted the month into an appropriately uh, granular month without the zero one days attached to it. And with this, I can convert it into a Sybil. But if I just do as Sybil, it will try to make some guesses. It will see that month is the time variable and we'll try to use that. But it's telling me that there's some problems. 
there are some duplicate rows and each time series is not identified uniquely by the index. What this is saying is that there are multiple points in time, multiple scripts for the exact same point in time. And that's because we haven't added any identifying key variables. So if I fill in the blanks here, index equals month, and my key variables, you can use tidy select for this. So you see concession type ATC1 and ATC2. You can see it's now happily giving me a Sybil because it has gone and checked that the data is structured correctly, that there is only one point in time, only one temporal observation for each time series. And in fact, it's identified that there are 336 different time series in this one data set. Okay, how are you going with that? Have you been able to follow along with converting the time column into a year month and then converting it into a civil? Okay, I see someone getting an error. Would you like to put your error in the chat? Okay, it seems like an error in mutate doesn't know how to handle the year month class yet. So that perhaps is already at Sybil. Ah, so I see what you've done wrong here. So you've got some brackets that are misaligned. We do a mutate step uh, first and then close the brackets for mutate. And then we pipe the entire thing into as Sybil. Anyone else having problems with that? Because we'll be using this data set uh, throughout the day. If you are stuck, this data set is included in the EPIP3 package. You can just directly type PBS and you'll get the Sybil data set already structured. Okay, there's another error. Uh, could not find concession. You've just made a typo with the word concession. Uh, it's a C after the letter N there. That's okay. It's often the simplest little mistakes, the smallest typos that uh, cause the most headaches when debugging our programming, or any programming for that matter. Capital letters, little uh, typos. Okay, Peter, uh, object type not found. What you're missing here with the key function, it needs to be combined together in the C function. So wrap all of your key variables with C. Okay, if you were having trouble setting this data set up, uh, you should be able to just use PBS as is, and this will already be at Sybil for you. Uh, that's included in the FPP3 package. Okay, let me bring my slides back up here. Okay, so now that we have a time series data set at Sybil, we can use existing tidyverse tools like dplyr to manipulate it. So for example, we might like to uh, calculate the total monthly cost of the A10 drug specifically. So we can use the filter function to set the ATC2 classification to be A10. And then we can summarize the total monthly cost. So we can sum up all of the costs uh, for that specific drug. 
And then we might like to do some group bias to compare this as well. We'll get there. So with PBS, we can filter out a specific time series. So there are our drugs for anti-diabetic therapy. And you can see the scripts, total number of uh, prescriptions given by the government here, and the total cost of the subsidies for the government of those scripts. But this is for a specific concession and type. So you can see that there's four different time series left after filtering out ATC2 being A10. To calculate the total, I can then summarize the total number of scripts. So if you've used summarize before, uh, this is probably familiar, but perhaps surprising that we still have the month column. I didn't use the group by function here, but I've still got my month column. And that's because a Sybil will always want to hold on to its time class. These are time aware operations, time aware dplyr functions now. So if you wanted to remove the month column, you would need to remove the Sybil class. So you'll see if you used regular dplyr with the tibble object, we just get the total number of scripts. But if we do a time series summarize, we get a time series summary. Now I can of course still use group by here. If I wanted to see the difference between concession and general subsidies over time. I can then group by concession, one of my key variables. And now I have concession, month, and scripts summed up. So now I have a total of two time series. I don't have the type of concession we had, which was safety net or general. I now just have the class of concession, if they were low income healthcare um, or not. So that would allow me to compare uh, the cost of different subsidy classes. So this implicit group by of the time index can be surprising for people, uh, but it's actually quite useful for when you're adding up uh, different series over time in a large collection of data. And it's something that we'll be working on a lot throughout the day. Sometimes you want to summarize over time. So you want to calculate the most expensive to subsidize drug in Australia, for example. If you wanted to do that, you no longer want a time series. So if I convert back to a tibble, group by ATC1, summarize the total cost. You can see that the most expensive category of drug type is ATC1 type C, or category C. I'm sure other people in this call will be more familiar with these codes than I am. But if I kept it as a Sybil, as I'll be able to see the most expensive drug for each month. And that's a very common, sensible thing to look at when working with time series. I'll skip a little bit ahead, just because I want to see the total cost over time. We'll see the auto plot function briefly. But you can see now we've got each of the, I think it's 14 different, 15 different classifications, cardiovascular. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. You can see that the cost of cardiovascular drugs at the top here has always been the most expensive to subsidize for the government, except for this brief time, perhaps where uh, this more blue color, I think this is N. We could uh, investigate that further if needed. Uh, seems to be pretty close to the minimum of the cardiovascular drug subsidy costs. Now, sometimes when you want to group across time, you want to change the time variable itself. Maybe I don't want the quarterly uh, subsidies, I want the annual subsidies. So I'm going to add across 
uh, using index by, which works very similar to group by. So in addition to group by ATC1, I might index by year, which is just pulling out the year from that month, changing my time class. So now my group operations will be ATC1 and yearly data, giving me 270 total groups. And when I do that same calculation, same code, you can see I get the same thing, but with yearly data. Now, you might be surprised to see this large drop at the end of the data. This is a very common uh, mistake people make with overinterpreting aggregated data. This is just because the data didn't have the entire year in it. It only stopped at June. So this is financial year data. So aggregating by years instead of uh, financial years causes this uh, unreliable drop off at the end. So once again, with time classes and calendars, you have to be really careful uh, to make sure that you're aggregating complete groups or removing them when they're not complete. Okay, we've had a little sneak peek at visualizing time series, but the purpose of visualizing time series is to identify the patterns that exist in the data. And by identifying the patterns, we can, ident we can choose appropriate models that will capture these patterns and forecast with them into the future. So some common patterns that we look for in time series are trends, continuous upward patterns or downward patterns, seasonalities, a repeating up and down pattern of a fixed period and fixed shape, cycles, which is another up and down pattern. It's commonly confused with seasonalities, but it's less regular than a seasonal pattern. We'll look at the difference more later. You might also have some covariates, uh, which is just like in regression, you have, uh, say, scripts, and that's strongly correlated with the cost of that script. And you might have specific events like COVID-19, which has affected all of the time series data that we're looking at today. Now, these aren't strictly a pattern, but these types of plots can also help us identify unusual events, anomalies and outliers as well. So the simplest and most common time series graphic that you've probably seen before is a time plot. And we create this using the auto plot function from ggplot2. So it can identify that you're using a Sybil. And when you pipe this Sybil into the auto plot function and say which measured variable you want to plot, in this case scripts, it will produce a plot, a time plot of that data. A time plot has the variable of interest scripts on the y-axis and the time observation, the index, on the x-axis. And this time plot is useful for finding the most uh, obvious patterns, I suppose. So here we can see a upward trend. Perhaps I can draw on this. Yes, you can see that. So this upward pattern through the center of the data is known as a trend. But you can also see a repeating up and down pattern in this data set as well. And this up and down pattern repeats every one year. So this is known as a seasonal pattern. And in particular here, the, free, the periodicity of this pattern is annual seasonality, repeating every year. So we've got monthly data, an annual pattern, annual seasonal pattern, and a trend in this data set. Now, looking at this plot, I want you to think, what is the peak? It's clear that in every year there's a peak amount of scripts produced in Australia. What month corresponds to the peak? Can you tell? Yeah, it's perhaps a bit surprising, this effect. Um, I'm not sure how this looks in other countries, but there is a very seasonal pattern with the amount of scripts. Flu season's a good idea. There's certainly some drugs in this data set which are affected by flu. But we saw the most common amount of scripts is uh, cardiovascular. Yeah, I think Pete is getting the idea. People get refills in January. Yeah, there's a specific month here that we can investigate closer with a different style of plot to see when the peak and the trough is. 
but it actually relates to the subsidy program that we have in Australia. If you consume or if you require a certain amount of prescriptions throughout the year, then a safety net copay comes in where the drug costs less until a certain end point on the year, which we can find by the peak. So at the end of this uh, time point, when the safety net uh, expires and you start paying the regular full price again, or the subsidy price, um, people stock up on their drug while they've uh, got the cheaper prices. So people complete their scripts closer towards the end of this uh, seasonal pattern, not because they need the drugs, but because they're stock stocking up on them due to financial reasons. Now, this time plot is useful for identifying trends and seasonalities, but it's not so easy to see exactly what month and what minimum, uh, what month correspond to the maximum and the minimum within each pattern. And for this, we like to use a season plot. So the gg underscore season function will still put the scripts on the y-axis, our response variable, but on the x-axis now, instead of having time, I've got the time within each year. And then the years are just stacked on top of each other with lines, colored lines. And this helps us more clearly see that February is the minimum. You can see uh, all of these lines drop quite sharply towards February and then increase throughout the rest of the year. And that the peak, it's increasing from February up until January until it drops. So the peak is in January, and then the trough is in February. Any questions with this so far? Okay, let's have a look at this together. So we're going to, is there any way to label the peaks? Uh, you probably could. Uh, the GG season function doesn't try to do uh, too much helpful things like labeling peaks, uh, but you could create your own plot to say, probably labeling is better. Add, adding a title saying the peak is in January, the trough is in February would be nicer. There's already a lot going on in this plot, but um, this isn't the type of plot that I'd use to share with someone. I might use box plots or a more summarized format of the data to show this. Okay, um, we'll look at an example a bit later. Another type of plot that we often use is seasonal subseries plots. Now, this is also a useful way to visualize seasonality. You can see the blue lines here correspond to the averages. And here, quite clearly, you can see that the average scripts in January is the highest, and the average scripts in February is the lowest. But the real purpose of this plot is to identify how the pattern changes over time. In particular, you can see that in March and April, the amount of scripts are starting to flatten out a little bit. In June, it's starting to decrease. July, it's pretty flat. But in other months, like February and August, it's continuing to increase. So the amount of scripts demanded in February is increasing relative to July and June and some other months. Similar can be said for August. So the shape of the seasonal pattern is changing slightly from year to year. And that's a good question. Is that years on the horizontal axis? axis? That's perfect. Exactly right. So rather than using colors to represent the years, like we had on the previous plot. In this previous plot, we're separating lines for each year. In this plot, we're separating lines for each month, time within a year, leaving the x-axis for being year. So it's kind of uh, flipped this plot around quite a lot, which helps I reveal a different pattern, the change in the seasonality. Any other questions with this? So most often we'll use a time plot to see the big patterns like trend and seasonality, see if there are the patterns that exist. 
And then a seasonal plot will help us identify some extra detail for exactly what the shape of the seasonality is, the peak in January, the trough in February. And then the subseries plot allows us to see if those patterns are changing over time. In this case, February and August are increasing relative to the other months. Okay, there's another question. Monthly prescription drug costs year on year are increasing. No surprises there, of course. Yes, so that's the trend that you see here. And it's quite often that we'll see a increasing trend in the data uh, due to inflation or due to uh, improvements in drugs or just greed, who knows. Um, but most time series that we see will have an increasing pattern over time. Now, this plot is perhaps a little advanced for today, uh, but I do think it's very important to show it. An ACF plot is a visualization of autocorrelations. So you may have heard of a correlation before. A correlation is where I have a bunch of points scattered together, and the correlation between these two is positive. Have you seen that before? So this might have a positive correlation of 0.8. Now, an autocorrelation is a temporal correlation between the time series and lags of itself. So on the y-axis here, I've got y, not in this plot. I'll get, get to this one. And then on the x-axis, I've got y lagged, so maybe t minus 1. And you can see there's a very strong relationship between uh, today's uh, demand for scripts and yesterday's demand for scripts or last month's demand in this case. And then what I do to create this plot is calculate the correlations at lag two, lag three, lag four, and so on. And then I, instead of plotting the whole scatter plot, I just plot the singular correlation. So the first order correlation was at 0.8. The second correlation was slightly weaker, 0 0.75, 0 0.7, etc. The main takeaway here, the abridged version of this, is to know that the ACF shows all sorts of patterns. So the autocorrelations, you see these blue dashed lines? They represent significance. And because the vertical, bar, uh, vertical lines, the correlations exceed these blue dash lines, that means there exists some patterns. You can also see at lag 12, it's a lot not, uh, larger than the ones around it. And that's because the seasonality is lining up. So if I have a repeating pattern like this, and I lag that by one observation, you see it's misaligned a little bit. But if I lag by 12 observations the same month, just a year later, it lines up again and the correlation gets a lot stronger between these two lines. So if we have a peak like this, that's an indication of seasonality. If we have a slow decay in the autocorrelations, that suggests that there's some sort of trend. Uh, if you didn't get this, that's okay. Uh, it's perhaps the most complicated visualization of time series that we'll be looking at today. Uh, but the important thing is looking at this blue dash line. If it's above the blue dash line, it just means that there's some pattern that exists in the data. Okay, now the big question, seasonal or cyclical? I've produced two plots here, two different time series. They're split up down the middle. And one of them is seasonal and one of them is cyclical. The difference between seasonal and cyclical patterns is that seasonality is very consistent. It's always every uh, year, or it's always every uh, day or week. There's lots of human behavior patterns that happen uh, weekly, say work days and non-working days. As opposed to the cyclical example, which is less consistent, it might be sunspots. Currently, we're at a sunspot maximum. There's a lot of space weather going on. We saw some beautiful auroras a few weeks ago. And those patterns repeat every 11 years or so, but not always 11 years, sometimes 10, 9, 12.
12, it varies from cycle to cycle. So the main difference between seasonality and cycl uh, cyclical patterns is the consistency of the pattern. So I'm going to call this one on the side A and this one B. And I just want you to have a guess, A or B, which one is the seasonal pattern? Remember, seasonal patterns are more regular, more predictable, more consistent. I'll give you a, a bit of time to put your guess in the chat. A or B, which one is seasonal? Seasonal being the more predictable, consistent uh, time series. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of A's and a couple of B's. Okay, so the majority has it. A is my seasonal pattern, you're correct. And B is my cyclical pattern. How can we tell? And thanks for answering the ACF questions. Uh, I don't quite have the time for that today. Um, maybe during the break I can get into that more. So how can I see that the left plots are seasonal and the right plots are cyclical? So I've given you both the time plot in the first row and the autocorrelation plot in the second row, and they both look fairly similar. They both have this up and down repeating pattern, but the one on the left is more consistent. Every year, if I break this up into years, we have the peak in the same spot and the troughs in the same spot. Whereas if I broke this up into the troughs, you can see that there's a longer gap between these observations and those observations. The spacing between the gaps, the patterns is less consistent. The other thing that you can look for to identify cyclical patterns compared to seasonal patterns is the magnitude or the amplitude of the pattern. So the amplitude of this pattern is similar year on year. Whereas in a cyclical pattern, as you're going up, you don't know if it's going to keep going up or if it's going to stop early. You can see that the amplitude is smaller compared to the year that uh, the cycle that followed, it was a much larger pattern a much larger cycle, I should say. Now, the autocorrelations are the most common way to identify cyclical patterns. And in the next hour, when we look at modeling these patterns, we'll see that cyclical patterns are better modeled using autocorrelations compared to direct plotting of the data. In particular, for the seasonal one, you can see the peak corresponds to 12. And this is a sensible repeating pattern. 12 months, one year, it's sensible uh, for this pattern to repeat every 12 months. There's a lot of things that repeat every year. For example, uh, temperature, the weather, uh, the, the seasons that most people would think of, summer, winter, autumn, spring, fall, if you're in America. So 12 months is a very common repeating pattern. And you can also see how sharp and symmetrical that pattern is. As opposed to the cyclical pattern, you can see that there's a peak at 10 years. What happens every 10 years? Well, what happens here is that it's a predator-prey relationship. This is the number of pelts uh, by the Hudson Bay Company uh, of the snowshoe, no, of the Canadian lynx. And the Canadian lynx eats the snowshoe hare, and then the population of the snowshoe hare decreases, then the lynx starve and then there's less links to eat the hares and the hares repopulate and it's always this uh, balance this uh, bistable uh, pattern between the population of links and the population of hares and that's what causes this cyclical pattern in the acf you can see it's a lot more rounded a lot more sinusoidal it's not a sharp pattern and you can also see Unlike what we, it was pretty hard to see in this plot exactly what the periodicity of this cycle was. 
is it nine years, 10 years, 11 years? Whereas in the ACF, it's more clear that the peak, the most common repeating time period for the cycle is 10 years. You can also see some asymmetry. The nine year pattern is more common than the 11 year pattern. So while the ACF is quite complex to look at, it does reveal some nice information, some extra detail, especially relating to the repeating patterns like seasonalities and cycles. Okay, so that's the first hour done. So we're going to have a short, perhaps five minute break, and then we're going to look at modeling these patterns with different statistical models and producing some forecasts. Uh, now is a good time for some questions. If you had any, feel free to unmute your mic or put it in the chat. And we'll take a five minute break. Okay, good question. Is there a GitHub repo with all of the materials? There sure is. So I'll put this in the, oops, put this back in the chat to everyone. Uh, you can see in the button up the top here, uh, this GitHub link will take you to all the source materials for this workshop. And as it seems with most workshops today, uh, this is also built using Cordo. Okay, what is a variogram? I I've only used these a couple of times, so I'll need to refresh myself with how these work. So it is similar in the fact that we have the lag on the x-axis, uh, but it's not necessarily a lag in distance. It might, in this case, it's a lag in time. Uh, I do think the semi-variance here is different though. Um, someone more familiar with variograms uh, could help answer this. Uh, but in our case for the time series, the ACF is the relationship, the correlation between uh, the data and itself. Whereas I'm not sure uh, the semi-variance here, what that represents. Okay, we'll give it three more minutes. Were there any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, we'll just show a little bit more on this uh, plotting uh, functionality. So the data set on the left that I was showing you for the seasonality versus cyclical patterns was United States accidental deaths. Now uh, these are things like falling off ladders. This is included in the data sets package bundled with R. And I can convert a TS object into a Sybil object using as Sybil, just like we did for the data frame. So you can see my time column is index, or my index variable is called index, and my measured variable is called value, monthly data. And if I auto plot the time, uh, the value column, the number of deaths, you can see that first plot that I showed, the strong seasonal pattern. Now, I want you to try to modify this code to produce a seasonal plot and tell me what peak the United States accidental deaths, uh, what month of the year corresponds to the peak deaths accidentally in the United States. Oh, I also see your amendment to the question, the live code, Libby. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll upload this live code as well. Let me save this actually. Uh, lab .r. I'll upload this on the Git repository. Oh, 
Okay, so to produce a season plot, just like we saw in the slides, we use the gg season function. It's just a matter of replacing auto plot with gg underscore season. And there we can see pretty clearly the peak corresponds to July. And the minimum, the trough, corresponds to February. Now this is pretty suspect. And it's a pattern that we see all the time in time series. Why do you think February has the least deaths? Are people less risky in February? It's the month of love. <laughs> exactly, it's the shortest month. There's less days in February. And that's a pretty common um, misconception. I, I show them a seasonal pattern, I show, and they're always stressing out, why are my sales so low in February? What's happening in February? And then it's a bit of a, of course, moment for them when I say there's only 28 days instead of 30 or 31. So when we come to simplifying patterns, often we adjust for the number of days in the month as well. Okay, is this pattern changing over time? We can look at a subseries plot. Okay, it does look like there's a little bit of change here in January and February. It seems to be continuing to decrease. Whereas in April, it decreased very quickly, but it's starting to turn around. In recent years, there's more deaths in April uh, compared to the other months. And that's similar in July, August. Most months have this uh, comeback period. And yes, Peter, leap years also um, make things more complex when it comes to February. Okay, and then the way I created that ACF plot that we saw on the last slide was a two-step process. We first calculate the autocorrelations using the ACF function. So then you can read off directly what those autocorrelations were for, spe for specific lags. And then you can auto plot these, just like we used auto plot for the Sybil object. Now that it's an ACF object, we can plot this. And you can see that sharp peak in uh, the 12 month repeating pattern, the annual pattern. Okay, now that we've identified some common patterns that we might like to uh, model, let's see how we might go about modeling these. And once we've got a model, we can make a forecast. Now, forecasting is difficult. Uh, just like with the weather forecasting, we're getting quite good at it now, but uh, the accuracy can leave some things to be desired. And a big problem with forecasting, most commonly forecasts are catastrophically wrong, uh, if I can, maybe I can remove my camera for a moment. It's because of hope casting. Uh, what do I mean by hope casting? So you can see these are the Government of Australia's plans uh, for the budget uh, quite a few years ago now. And in the black line, I have the actual uh, surplus of the budget. You can actually see it's negative, so it's a deficit in the cash balance. And year on year, the government's always very optimistic in forecasting, saying that we're going to recover, we're going to be back to a surplus in our cash balance within a few years. And this might be based on their planning, maybe they've incorporated this into their budget in a few years, but of course, unexpected events come up, extra reasons, maybe the uh, political cycle comes around again and they start spending more money. And every year they've biased their forecast. The actual values are saying that they're still in a deficit and that their forecast to return to a surplus are always wrong. This also happened in the PBS data set, the one that we we're looking at before. It was under budget, um, under budgeted by about a billion dollars. Uh, quite a few years ago in the early thousands. 
2000s. And uh, that was causing a huge problem when it came to government budgeting. Much like we see in this plot, they forecasted that subsidizing drugs in Australia is going to be cheap. We're going to have it under control. Inflation's not a problem, stuff like that. And they would blow out the budget year on year and have to print more money or uh, take cuts from other areas of government spending. So most often hope casting is uh, the reason why forecasts are catastrophically wrong. And that's when you're incorporating some hopeful planning based on perhaps uh, people that aren't so motivated to create accurate forecasts, but good sounding forecasts. So there's a little bit of tension here when I produce a forecast, which uh, doesn't look good for the company or doesn't look good for the government saying that, no, the PBS will actually cost a lot more money than you're planning it to. But there are some things that are easier to forecast than other things. So here's a list of uh, eight different time series that we might like to forecast, and some of them are easier than others. Um, I want you to try and pick out a number, one through eight, and put it in the chat. Which one of these do you think is the easiest to forecast? So how could we, of these time series, which one do you think we'd forecast most accurately? Okay, two or three, 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 five. Eight. Yeah, you've all got the right idea. Uh, it is two and three. Um, probably three. We get that down to, you know, milliseconds. It's celestial bodies that don't have a lot of variance. Um, we've modeled this using physics and astrophysics, and we've got a very clear understanding of uh, what the sunrise will be and when celestial bodies like Halley's Comet will pass by Australia and uh, pass by the world. So two and three are very easy to forecast. What do you think is the most difficult to forecast? So from this list, uh, put in a number again, what do you think is the hardest thing to forecast here? Okay, a lot more variability here, but it does seem like the consensus is five. So the Google stock price in six months, that would be correct. And as Libby points out, if stocks were easy to forecast, uh, we'd all be rich, or perhaps not. If stocks were easy to forecast, then everyone would forecast them and make uh, no money, <laughs> which is the efficient market hypothesis as well. They got us again with that hypothesis. So interesting to see that everyone's pointed out five instead of four. They're both stock prices but one is a stock price tomorrow and another one is in six months time. So this is a very common uh, difficulty in forecasting. The further ahead that you try to forecast, the more difficult it is to produce that forecast accurately. So things like exchange rates, uh, stock prices, these are very difficult to forecast. And as again, Libby's um, very accurate here, whenever there's humans involved, it becomes very difficult. So things like total sales of uh, drugs in Australia uh, that we've been looking at before. So that was this plot here. This is fairly easy to forecast. Um, ignoring the big drop off that we talked about before, I'll just remove the monthly aggregate. There is quite a bit of variability in the seasonal pattern. There's a fair bit of randomness, uh, but generally there's this upward pattern that we could uh, just roughly draw into the future. Maybe it's flattening out recently, so I can draw a, a slightly flatter line. We've got a decent idea of what it might be. But for the stock market, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. It follows a somewhat random process. Electricity demand in three days time is also quite difficult. It depends a lot on the weather. 
and three days ahead, we have a decent idea of the weather, but not a great idea. We don't know for sure if it's going to rain or not, if it's going to be uh, 28 degrees or 26 degrees Celsius. So that will all affect the electricity demand uh, quite substantially. So to summarize these forecastability factors, uh, there's a few main points uh, that make it easy or difficult to forecast. It's easier if we know how it's forecasted or what the model behind it is. So if we have a good understanding of how the sun works and how we orbit around, uh, how the, the earth rotates, then because we have a good understanding and the, of the factors involved with this forecast, we can produce an accurate forecast. Similar to Halley's Comet. Now we have a decent understanding of the drugs demanded, uh, sales of drugs in Australia. We know that there's this effect that happens in January, moving into February, where everyone stocks up on drugs for the subsidies changing. Uh, we know the relative uh, need for different types of drugs in Australia. We've got quite a lot of information to help understand uh, what's driving the sales of drugs in Australia. And the other benefit to this is that there's a lot of data available. We've got monthly data going back for many years. Now, this one is perhaps the trickiest one to think about. The forecasts can't affect the thing that we're trying to forecast. Now, this is relating to forecastability and accuracy, but it's not necessarily a problem. This happened a lot in the past few years when I was forecasting COVID cases. If I forecasted COVID cases were going to start up another exponential growth, and I forecasted that it's going to continue growing, and then the government sees these forecasts and says, hang on, our hospitals can't uh, support this many infected people. We need to impose some restrictions, some uh, control measures in order to reduce the spread. And then the actual cases are actually a bit flatter. So my forecast is completely wrong. You can see a large error between these two lines, but that doesn't necessarily mean that my forecast was bad. It actually is a good forecast that wasn't accurate because it was able to make an impact that uh, was useful. So forecasts that can help make decisions are more useful, I suppose, than accurate forecasts. Now, if the government didn't put in those extra control measures, didn't impose that policy, then my, uh, the actual data might match my forecast much more closely. But in terms of forecastability, since my forecasts were affecting the variable that I'm forecasting, it becomes a lot more difficult to get an accurate prediction. Now, Natural variation, some time series are simpler than others. So you can see that uh, this uh, cardiovascular drugs, this top one here, has a fair bit of randomness in the pattern. Whereas the United States accidental deaths that we were looking at just before was a lot more consistent. So different patterns have, different data sets have different amounts of natural unexplained randomness in them. And the more random they are, the harder they are to forecast accurately. And underpinning all of our forecasting is this big assumption that the future will be similar to the past. And you can see that that might cause some problems. So how do we make good forecasts? Uh, we make them using statistics rather than uh, hope casting. We like to use something more rigorous, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't incorporate uh, some expert judgment or some planning into these forecasts as well, as long as we expect those plans to follow through. And more recently, with ML, uh, you might use it computationally. I'm not going to get into this debate. It's all statistics. Uh, but we might consider forecasting the tourists coming to Australia. Now, when we think about underlying variants, this is a fairly consistent uh, pattern. You can see that there's some anomalies, like there's this unusually low drop in visitors that happened in 2003. But generally speaking, it seems to have a trend and a seasonal pattern, which is fairly consistent and predictable. So to produce a forecast for this, I'll make a statistical model that predicts one possible future. 
it looks like this. <coughs> so in one possible future reality, my number of visitors coming to Australia would look like this. Maybe it's a little bit low. That's up for your judgment. Is this a good forecast? Maybe a quick yes or no in the chat. What do you think? Um, is this a reasonable forecast? Is it good enough? Yeah, a lot of yeses. Pandemic's going to mess with everything. Yes, you can see the future. I appreciate your accurate forecasting. Yeah, it matches the historical data quite a lot. It has the trend. It has some seasonality. It's in roughly the right place. What about this possible alternative future? So here's a second possible reality. Uh, is this one reasonable? It's forecasting that it's going to turn around, start decreasing. And it has decreased in the past. It's increasing here, and then it starts decreasing a little bit. What's to say that won't happen again? It could happen. It's a possible future that we haven't yet observed. It still has the seasonality, it still has a lot of patterns that we want, but maybe we don't think this is a, as realistic as the orange line. I can add a green one on top of this. It starts looking a bit like spaghetti. Now this green line has a fairly flat trend in the middle of the other two forecasts, but Ultimately, if we just have one forecast, we're going to be wrong. And that's where, uh, as suggested in the chat, some confidence bounds might be helpful. If I produce 10 forecasts, 10 possible futures, you can see there's quite a lot of variability in what might happen next. This is all based on a statistical model, the ETS model that we'll see at the end of the session. And then I might put in hundreds of different forecasts. And now it looks like a very interesting art project. Not really my favorite style of art. <laughs> art. <laughs> um, but this is where we might like to uh, remove the color. It's not so useful. But we can still see that in all of these possible futures, there's some minimums, some peaks. There's this seasonal pattern coming through. And it's generally producing this somewhat flat trajectory. So you might say, I've seen 100 possible futures. What about I just average them? And uh, that will be my best forecast. Central limit theorem, if you've heard of that, um, also applies here. And often we look at the mean of the distribution as our point forecast. But rather than focusing just on point forecasts, it's much better to consider entire intervals. So based on these possible 100 futures, I might take the quantiles from this. So the 50% interval, saying that we expect 50% of the time the data, the actual data to be within them, within that range, and take the 90% interval from the uh, lower 5% and upper 5% quantiles of the samples. And that will give me a 90% confidence range an interval where the data will be within that range, assuming all the things that the model assumes. Zooming in a little bit, you can see what do you think of these forecasts compared to all of the single line paths? Having some intervals, having some uncertainty around the future is producing a much better forecast, a much more realistic forecast, because it's very unrealistic to say that uh, it will be exactly this, then we're definitely wrong. And it's not very useful to say, this is my forecast. Whereas adding a whole range of uncertainty with this is much more useful for decision-making. Now, of course, uh, the big assumption that we talked about uh, is that the future looks like the past. And of course it was looking good for the next two years and then COVID-19 came. And this really derailed one of the projects that I was working on forecasting. And that's because uh, I was working for Tourism Research Australia and they want to know how many tourists are coming to Australia. And very quickly when the pandemic started, just four months into the project, uh, the project completely changed to be 
When will we recover from COVID-19? When will we have tourists coming back to Australia? And that's quite an interesting, difficult forecasting problem uh, where statistics is less helpful in this case. And it still has use, but we need to use uh, external sources of information and more judgmental uh, opinions based on uh, experts in the field. And yes, it's a really hard sell to say, here's my forecasts, I don't know what's going to happen, adding these uncertainty ranges. Uh, but quite often, it's useful for uh, demand planning. Uh, say I was working for a supermarket, and they want to make sure that they're not out of stock, but they don't have too much stock, that everything's going to go bad and they have to discount things too much. So they might have a tolerance, they might want to produce a 80% likelihood to not be out of stock on any given hour. And you can use the entire distribution, the intervals, in order to plan for this. This is also very relevant for electricity demand, uh, a project I've worked on in the past, where, of course, you don't want to run out of electricity. It's going to be a big problem if there's a big brownout or power outage across the country. So you want to produce enough power so that you don't run out, but also not too much power that you're not wasting unnecessary resources generating that electricity. So the uncertainty here, the intervals, are perhaps the most relevant part of the forecast. And that's why I really want to emphasize the distributions that we get from these forecasts. And no, we don't have tourist data in Australia from 1921. Australia is a fairly young country that hasn't collected data for that long. Yeah, lots of demand planning, staffing planning. Uh, uncertainty is really relevant for these decision-making processes, much more than just a specific point forecast can help you with. So what makes a forecast good? They need to be probabilistic, have some uncertainty around them. Otherwise, it's just a... a a dart thrown at a board. You don't know exactly how confident you will be. You just get one specific uh, prediction, which is far less useful than an entire range of uncertain predictions. But more than that, I think good forecasts need to be useful for making decisions. If you're producing forecasts and they're not helping anything, then what's the point of making the forecast? They have to help with planning, uh, logistics, decision making. And that can sometimes be in conflict with the accuracy of your forecasts, like I was discussing with COVID-19 predictions. Now, the simple things also have to be captured. So if you've got trend and seasonality in your data, your forecast should also have trend and seasonality. You need to capture the information that exists in the past, but we assume that pattern will continue into the future. So going back to this COVID example, uh, with the tourism coming to Australia. Are these forecasts bad? I'm clearly not very accurate with the pandemic, but does that make them a bad forecast? Certainly the company that I produced these forecasts for might try to claim that I did a bad job and made a bad forecast. Look how wrong I was. How could I not possibly anticipate the pandemic? Try to get their money back. But these forecasts are still actually useful for decision making and planning. Because these are now counterfactual forecasts. What if the pandemic didn't happen? How many tourists would have came to Australia if the pandemic didn't happen? Now we can think about calculating how much loss there was to the tourism industry, how much support they might need from the government to stay afloat. So these counterfactual forecasts still have value for decision making. And even though their accuracy is quite bad here, doesn't mean they're bad forecasts. Using the information that we had in the past, we replicated those patterns quite well into the future. Okay, there's a long question in the chat. In linear regression outside time series, there's a distinction between confidence intervals and prediction intervals. Uh, which of those does time series forecasting forecast, or is it something different? Uh, in this case, they are prediction intervals. 
or forecast intervals, we call them. Prediction and forecast is pretty interchangeable. Uh, forecast is just a prediction term, but for time, predicting time. Uh, the confidence intervals are often more related towards um, the parameters of a model, how confident we are that it's exactly this parameter. And it's not something we look at as much in time series. So the forecast intervals that we've been plotting is the uh, probability or the range of observations that we'd expect for the data. It's not pertaining to the uh, coefficients or the model or stuff like that. Of course, it's conditional on the model, but um, the intervals, the uncertainty is relating to the data and what we expect that future data to be. It's a very subtle difference um, that in practice doesn't cause much difference, but uh, it is an important distinction. Okay, so let's dream up some simple forecasting models. Now, assuming that you haven't seen modeling before or forecasting before, I should say, uh, how would you go about forecasting the number of visitors to Australia? So that's this data set here. It had a trend, trend going up, a seasonal pattern repeating. How would you produce a forecast of that pattern that continues into the future? So get creative. Maybe you want to calculate some averages, draw some lines on a plot, ask someone that knows better than you. There's lots of ways that you might produce a forecast. Have a think uh, briefly, and if you've got an idea, put it in the chat. Uh, how would you produce a forecast? Plotting the data is a good start. You want to see the patterns that exist in the data. Phoning a friend is a great option. You can phone me. <laughs> uh, wonder detecting infrastructure, bottleneck ceilings. You run out of operating rooms so that you can't grow. Are there limiting resources? Yeah, there's a lot of good questions in there that might affect the forecasts. Uh, especially capacity constraints are a big one. Uh, at Monash University, uh, where I'm doing my PhD, I've worked on forecasting projects where there are limits on the number of students that can be in a particular course. And so when we forecast that course, the number of enrollments in that course, uh, we can't, must ensure that our forecasts don't exceed that limit. Looking at historical values and their relationships with other variables. Yep, that's a very cross-sectional approach, uh, which we will be talking about in the next half hour. It's actually a great suggestion there. Better to average the answers of a number of friends. And that's exactly what we did for predicting when uh, the tourism industry would recover from COVID. We essentially just put out a survey to several hundred experts, business leaders, uh, epidemiologists, experts in that uh, decision-making process, uh, prediction process, because we didn't have the data to identify when we'd recover. We haven't seen pandemics like this with the amount of data that we needed to model this. So. The best we had was asking experts and producing an average of their guesses or uh, forecast distributions from their uncertainty, uh, from their guesses. And that worked out to be really accurate, in fact. So fit a model to existing past data, choose some predictors, parameters. Yeah, that's a very generic um, description of the modeling process. Um, it's quite difficult to think about how you might forecast, but here's some ideas. These are some simple forecasting models that we use as benchmarks all the time to see if our models are accurate or not. Yeah, Peter's suggesting maybe the economy is good and that would increase the number of tourists and uh, the economy of neighboring regions as well for where people might come to Australia from. These are all very um, good ideas, but very complex ideas. And I want to start very simple. So what's the simplest forecast we can create? And this is actually one of the most difficult models to produce more accurate forecasts for. 
and that's the naive model. All it does is takes the most recent observation and then says, that's my forecast. All future values are just my most recent number of scripts sold. Very simple. Now, this is uh, very, very hard to beat for the stock market, especially for exchange rates. Uh, whenever the efficient market hypothesis comes in, this is the optimal model based on economic theory. So it can be quite difficult to beat this, but of course you can see that this model isn't capturing a lot of the relevant patterns that exist in this data. Yeah, exactly. Last observation carry forward. That's the naive model that we're looking at here. So what this model doesn't capture is the trend. It doesn't capture the seasonality. We don't see any wobbles, but it is capturing this variability in the intervals. So it's not a terrible forecast. It's still giving me a reasonable range. That range is far too wide for this uh, particular data set. But it's not terrible. It's very simple and it's going to be uh, a benchmark for us to compare against. What about this method, the seasonal naive for model? Instead of carrying the last observation into the future as my forecasts, when I'm forecasting January, I'll look at the most recent time I've seen January and use that value. February, I'll look at the most recent February and use that value. I look at the most recent seasonal observation and just repeat that seasonal pattern into the future. So looking at this shape of the forecast, you can see the intervals are a lot narrower now. The model is a lot more confident about its ability to model the patterns that exist. And these forecasts for many uh, applications, many uh, use cases might be good enough. Of course, there's a lot of room for improvement. This doesn't capture the trend at all, uh, but it, at least for the short-term forecast, will be quite accurate for modeling the seasonality. So this isn't any, well, it is a model behind it, but it's not anything complicated. We haven't uh, looked for any covariates. We haven't looked at the tourists coming from Asia or uh, Europe into Australia. All we've done is taken the number of tourists, or in this case, the number of scripts, drugs sold um, in the last year and copied that entire year into the future. Very simple ideas here. Okay, how would we get trend? in a forecast. A very simple way to get trend in the data is just a rise of a run. I'll just take the first of the last observation and the first observation, draw a straight line between them, and that's my forecast. Pretty simple ideas, okay? Now this also is not a great forecast. And you can see that with the very uncertain intervals that we're getting from this forecast distribution. And a big reason for this is because we've not captured any seasonality. And it's worsened by the fact that the last observation happens to be a minimum. So my forecasts ask you down quite a bit. If it was more average through the middle of the data, like you might get with regression, the forecast would start a bit higher up and be quite different. Now, putting these two ideas together, the seasonal naive model, which copied the most recent seasonality, and the drift model, which copied, uh, drew a line between the first and last observations, we can create a decent model called the seasonal naive with drift model. And all this does is copy uh, the steps from before. The first and last observation will be connected, but this time it's without the seasonality. The seasonality is being copied across from the previous year. And that gives me quite a good forecast with a very simple method. So this seasonal shape is exactly the same as the most recent season. It's not smoothing out from the most uh, from the previous years. It's very using very little data and very little computational time and optimization in order to produce these forecasts. Okay, let's see how we do this in R. So. I want you to try this out for yourself. Uh, we're going to move into R. I'll put this in the chat again. OK. 
Okay, there you go. Now we don't have the PBS scripts data set yet. Uh, we'll have to create that one together. And I'll just put a link to the workshop materials uh, in the chat again. There we go. Okay, so back into R, we're going to calculate PBS scripts. <laughs> I've already done this from the last session, actually. Uh, and this is just going to be the total number of scripts uh, in Australia by each month. So this is from the PBS data set. I'm going to calculate, make sure I don't put any typos in here. The total number of scripts in each month. So remember that the time column, the index is automatically grouped. I encourage you to try this with me. We can have a look at this data set using autoplot to see the uh, relevant patterns that we want to capture with our forecast. You can see a clear upward trend and some seasonality, this repeating pattern. And then to model it, I pipe my time series data set, my Sybil, into the model function and then specify the different types of models. And the way that you specify a naive model is using the naive function and then the variable that you want to forecast. And just like you do with a regression model, the LM function in R, you can use the formula, the tilde, and then specify some extra things that you want to include in this model. Uh, unlike regression models, most time series models don't work with covariates, uh, but we do have special terms like drift here, uh, trend and seasonality, uh, which can capture those patterns. So we're going to add in this drift for the naive model and a drift for the seasonal naive model. And then what I get from this is a Mabel. You can see I get one row and four columns. My one row is for my singular time series that are plotted here, and my four columns are for the four different types of models that I've estimated. And then to produce forecasts from this model, we pipe the Mabel into the forecast function, and then we specify the forecast horizon. That's what H is. So I'm going to forecast two years ahead. This can be a number of observations or a text description of how far to forecast ahead. And then you'll see that I get a fable, a forecasting table, the name of a package. A uh, fable is also uh, a fairy tale. And maybe your forecasts are fairy tales. They're some story about the future, and hopefully you have an accurate, happy ending of your forecast. Happily ever, happily ever after. Um, not always the case. But most importantly here, a fable looks very similar to a Sybil. We've got our, our temporal frequency, one month, our key variables. In this case, I've got the dot model column to identify what model produced the forecasts. But importantly, my scripts variable is not a number anymore. It's an entire distribution. So you can see these forecasts are producing a normal distribution with a specific mean and variance. Now there's a question in the chat. Uh, what does the drift uh, that I've got in the model specification here do? The drift is what adds this uh, slope. So let me go back to this line. The drift term in a model will connect the first and last observations, roughly speaking, and calculate one big rise over run for the entire history of the data. So that will give me the average slope, which I can use to produce a trend in my forecasts. Does that help? So I can add that same technique, this rise over run, um, for the seasonal model as well which gives me a fairly reasonable, accurate forecast.
Okay, so just like at Sybil and how we manipulated it in the past, uh, a fable can be used in the exact same way. You can filter this, you can mutate, summarize, whatever you need to do. And importantly, we have the distribution here for scripts. Uh, with this, we can manipulate the scripts, the distribution. So we can calculate the intervals from it, say. So maybe I want a 95% interval. I can use the high-low function for the high bound, the upper bound, and the lower bound to find the range of possible values that we expect in that month. I can also say calculate the median from that distribution. So my mean is, uh, what's that, 1.21 million, 12 million, and yeah, 12 million. And my median is also 12 million. These are symmetrical distributions in this case. Now, looking at a big table of forecasts, especially when we've got the distribution here, uh, isn't so useful in my experience. I much prefer to produce visualizations of the data. And for this, we have another autoplot function to visualize our forecasts. So if I pipe, pipe this into the autoplot function, you can see I get a plot of my forecasts, but often when we look at forecasts, we also need to see the historical data. We need some context behind these forecasts just to evaluate if they're reasonable or not. And the fable object, the forecasts, don't have any understanding of the past, the present, or the future. There's no data attached to this. It's all just predictions. So when I plot this, I need to add in the data along with it. So in the first argument, if I add the entire data set, then I get a plot of the past along with the possible futures produced by my model's forecasts. I can adjust the forecast horizon, maybe 10 years. And you can see I get a much longer forecast horizon. And importantly, this blue forecast, the seasonal naive with drift, seems to be doing a reasonable job at capturing the trend and seasonality. But this is still a little bit limited because it's just connecting the first and last observations. And that's not realistic if the trend is changing. Uh, imagine if I used the drift method and my time series was going up and then started decreasing. If I used a drift method, just connecting the first and last observations, my forecast will go up. And that's not very realistic. And something similar is happening here. The, the data is going up and then it starts decreasing a bit to exaggerate that. Okay, any questions with the simple forecasting methods? Okay, moving on. Uh, I saw this suggested in the chat before. How about we use a regression when I was talking about some possible ways to forecast? And that's something that is done. Uh, you can use regular cross-sectional regression to produce time series forecasts, or in this case, you might call them predictions. And to do this, we often use time as a predictor. Time is our covariate, but we use different uh, representations of time to capture different patterns. In particular, we capture the trend just using the index itself, t. So here I've got yt. And my trend has a constant coefficient, my trend coefficient, and just the trend is the time index. So as time increases month by month, this number will go up one by one and then add on an additional beta one in each step. So that gives me my trend. This is a global trend. It doesn't change over time. And I can also use dummy variables to represent the seasonality. It will turn on if we're in January, uh, for the January dummy variable and turn off for the other months. February will turn on for the February months, but off for the other months. 
And this allows me to do a level shift whenever uh, each season is activated. Of course, subject to the dummy variable trap, I should have put M minus one here. And yes, you can use a piecewise GAN. Um, actually, the profit model, some of you may have heard of the profit model if you've uh, read Facebook's forecasting model or uh, had any interest in forecasting, and that uses a piecewise GAN. So you can use uh, more advanced regression cross-sectional techniques. Uh, if the trend is not monotonic, you can use uh, splines, you can use um, smooth, uh, what is it? Um, cubic splines, B splines, um, different nonlinear additive uh, models to capture trend. Now to produce a forecast with regression with a linear trend and seasonal dummy variables, we use this model specification, just like we used naive and seasonal naive in the past. For a time series linear modeling, we use the TSLM function, our response variable on the left, and our predictors trend and seasonality on the right. So let's remove the models that didn't do very well, naive and naive with drift. And I'm going to add in a regression model. Thanks for staying up so late. Uh, I'll put the recording out for you to catch up if you're interested. Okay, so now I've switched out my models a little bit by changing the model specifications. I've got a seasonal naive model, seasonal naive with drift, and a regression with a linear trend and dummy variable seasonality. And you can see there's quite a lot of overplotting. I can simplify this a bit. I'll do something that uh, is perhaps not the best. Remove the uncertainty for now. You can see the regression model here in blue is very similar to the red line, the seasonal naive with drift. So they're very comparable forecasts. But the seasonality in the regression is averaged over all years, whereas the seasonal naive is just taking the most recent seasonal year, seasonal pattern. Which one is better? Well, that's for the next hour to look at. Uh, we are a bit short on time, so unfortunately I will have to skip this exercise. Uh, but I do want you to copy this into R and run it. I'll put this in the chat again, uh, because in future exercises we'll be using this PBS A10 dataset. Uh, Chris asks, uh, could this be used to uh, detect anomalies if we have weekly observations and then one of the observations is now uh, probably anomalous? Is it within the prediction intervals? Uh, yes, that's exactly what you can do. You can see uh, if you really trust your forecasts are accurate and the data doesn't look like your forecast, then that could be an anomaly. Uh, if I need to pipe this in. Uh, there is built-in uh, anomaly detection We're using the outliers function. You can take a model. Uh, it's pretty underdeveloped at this stage. Um, there's not many models that support the outliers. But the idea, this isn't something that will work uh, today. The idea is that you estimate a model and then you detect which of the data, set, data observations were outliers using that outliers function. Very similar idea. Okay, so this is the A10 uh, drug. I think this was anti-diabetic drugs. Yeah, anti-diabetic drugs. And we'll be looking at this time series uh, for the rest of the uh, workshop. Okay, so let's produce a forecast for this. We'll do this one together. So this one clearly has trend and seasonality, just like the other data set. So I might use regression for this. Model TSLM scripts against trend plus seasonality. 
make a forecast, plot those forecasts into the future, and hopefully they look reasonable. It's a good sanity check to look at these forecasts. And they're in the right place. They have this uh, repeating seasonal pattern that we expect. Maybe we exaggerate this by forecasting a bit longer into the future. Yeah, it looks reasonable. Um, there is something that it's missing. Um, can anyone criticize these forecasts in some way? What doesn't look reasonable about these? Yeah, the amplitude isn't captured very well. That's exactly right. So the seasonality is fluctuating in my forecast by this much, but my re most recent observations have fluctuated more. So my seasonal naive model might actually do better in this case. Uh, we can compare that seasonal naive scripts with a drift. So it's pretty quick to switch out models and compare models. You can see the red lines now are the seasonal naive, and they have much wider amplitudes of my seasonal pattern. And that's because it's just copying the most recent year. So why is this happening? It's because the regression model will average all of time. It doesn't allow the patterns to change over time. And at the start of the time series, the amplitude is very small. At the end of the time series, the amplitude is very large. And so the regression model is taking the average. It's being bad at everything. <laughs> and it's following that amplitude, the average amplitude through into the future. And this is a problem for uh, time series and why regression models aren't used as often and tend to not perform as well is because time series patterns change over time. We saw the seasonality might change over time with the subseries plot. The amplitude might change over time. There's lots of uh, patterns which vary over time when working with time series. But there is one thing that the regression model does quite well and that is using extra information. You might think that the scripts will be a function of how much they cost. If they're too expensive, people might not use as many scripts. So I might like to, just with the regression model, add in cost. So in this case, TSLM can add exogenous regressors, additional information, but, and I can model this. So now I get my TSLM. But when I come to forecasting this, I get an error. And this error was expected. It says object cost not found. And this is the real tricky part when it comes to forecasting with extra information. In order to produce a forecast using cost in my model for this observation, I need to know what the total cost of the subsidies were to the government at that point in time. And that's just as difficult as it is to forecast the total number of scripts. If you know one, you can kind of calculate the other. So when you come to using extra information, you need to be careful that that extra information is also easily known, predictable, or controllable. So that's summarized here. Now, this is also really useful for decision making. Uh, suppose when I was doing the COVID forecasting for the government, they wanted to know uh, how many cases there would be with certain constraints imposed. So maybe if people couldn't travel uh, interstate, how would that affect the spread of COVID-19? I could add that into my model if we had enough past data and produce predictions for how many uh, cases will be reduced or how the cases will change if that policy was put into place. And this is a uh, easy to predict uh, variable in my model because it's controllable. The government can set the policy and therefore it's well known what that uh, policy will be into the future. Other things might be more predictable. So say electricity demand and temperature uh, are very strongly related. We know a decent idea of what the temperature will be tomorrow and the next day. And that really helps with short-term demand planning. We also have a decent idea of what the temperature will be 
in general for winter and summer, uh, but that's less uh, predictable day by day. You don't know exactly what the temperature will be in the middle of winter on one specific day. Okay, so another more useful model here, oh, there's a question, relevant question there. If we know the policy, how would you know the effect of that policy on case incidents? Uh, this would be when we're forecasting uh, the effect of that policy after we've already observed that policy in this country or even in other countries as well. So we saw, uh, for example, the United States might put in some mask mandates, for example, and then Australia can learn from the effect of the mask mandates on how it might affect our population, even if we haven't done that ourselves yet. So wherever you can collect the data, if you can incorporate it somehow into your model, um, you can use this as a regression. Uh, uh, scenario forecasting. Uh, another useful point, a super short horizon is easier to predict with exogenous variables. That's right. So in general, you can see our forecasts are growing in uncertainty over time. Maybe if I put the seasonal naive model on there. You can see that the intervals for this model are getting wider. To exaggerate and that's because the further ahead you forecast the more uncertainty you have about what that will be so that also applies to your exogenous regressors as well the further ahead you need to predict them the harder it will be to predict predicting temperature tomorrow is pretty easy next week a bit trickier now a lot of these problems with the regression model come down to how the time series patterns are fixed. They can't change over time. And exponential smoothing is a very similar structure of model, but it allows the coefficients to change over time. And this could be a little tricky to get your head wrapped around, um, but this LT minus one is known as the level. And this is equivalent to the intercept. If I had a time plot here, and my data looked like this, a regression intercept would just go through the average. Okay. A time varying intercept will try to follow it fairly closely. And for that reason, bt minus one is my trend coefficient, beta one. Now I don't need the t here because the overall contribution of the time index is captured by the level because it's able to change over time. But notice how this has a T subscript. The slope can change with time. Additionally, we have the seasonality, also subscript T. This seasonality can change in shape over time. Now there's uh, some nice smoothing uh, statistics and theory behind this for how it works. Uh, we don't have the time or scope to get into this in just three hours. Uh, but just like the other models, it is quite simple to specify. Here I specify an additive ETS model with additive errors. See how the errors are added on. Additive trend, we've added the trend on. And additive seasonality, I've added the seasonality on. So I can copy this into my model. And instead of Y, I'm predicting scripts. And I can't predict cost. Uh, let me actually just move this into a new thing so that we've got more history in, these, in this code. So removing cost and adding uh, the ETS model. Let me copy that again. Oops, too much copying and pasting. Okay, comparing a regression model with an exponential smoothing model, you can see that the exponential smoothing model produces, um, let me give us some more space to see this. Maybe I'll just zoom in.
you can see that the exponential smoothing model has much wider intervals. And that might suggest that it's less confident about its forecasts, which is uh, accurate for reasons we'll see later. Um, but you can also see that the uh, pattern, the seasonality is slightly wider than the blue one from the TSLM. And that's because the seasonality has been able to change over time and capture the changing amplitude. Now, exponential smoothing goes one step further from regression um, in that the structure doesn't need to be additive. Remember, regression is strictly additive. You add together the coefficients, and it's a linear additive model. Whereas exponential smoothing, you can modify the structure of the model to be multiplicative. So in this case, I've got my seasonality multiplied by my level, and my trend is added to my level, and my error is added as well. So this model is an additive error, additive trend, multiplicative seasonality. Now this is really useful because a very common pattern that we have in time series looks like this. Your seasonality starts with a very small amplitude and grows very large with the level of the series. So whenever the variation is proportionate to the level, the y-axis, we have multiplicative patterns. So this is yt, and this is t. Now, by multiplying the same seasonal pattern, the seasonal pattern might look like this, by multiplying that with a trend, I will multiply the same pattern by a small number, which shrinks the amplitude, and then the same uh, seasonality by a bigger number, which gives me a larger amplitude. So a lot of this complexity in the model, uh, complexity in the data, can be captured just by changing the way the equation is structured. Now, you don't need to worry so much about the details of that for today. Uh, not enough time to get into all of the details. But fortunately, the ETS model can be chosen automatically. It can detect if it should be additive or multiplicative for the error, trend, and seasonal components. And to do this automatic selection, you just need to do less work. You just don't specify the right-hand side. You just say ETS of the variable you want to predict. So to produce an even better model than this AAA model, I'll just simply type ETS of scripts and it will automatically identify that we have multiplicative seasonality in this data set. Now it has to churn through a few more models in order to figure this out, uh, but you can now see that the forecasts from the ETS model, maybe I'll remove this uh, TSLM model, You can see that from the forecast mean, the variation in my seasonal pattern is growing. The amplitude of my pattern is expanding with time, or more relevantly, the uh, level of the series. As the trend increases, so does the seasonal variation. And this looks like a great forecast to me. Uh, when we forecast 10 years ahead, of course, the variability expands, and that's because there's quite a lot of inherent uh, unexplained randomness in the historical data. But for the first three or four years, we have a very clear idea of what the future will be, and that would be a great forecast uh, to produce for the client. Now, we can also look at the structure of the model. If I just run the first part and look at the Mabel, you can see that it's chosen multiplicative errors. That means that the errors are getting more random, more variable when the level of the series increases. You can see that there's a bit more randomness up here than there was randomness down here. There's an additive trend, looks pretty straight to me, and a multiplicative seasonality.
which we saw before. A Mabel is a model table, just like a forecast table is a fable. We had a bit of fun with the wordplay with these objects. The alternative, actually, when we were thinking about these names, we were thinking we have Tibble, we have Sybil for a time series Sybil. Maybe we want a model Tibble, a Mibble. That sounded a bit funny to us, but we definitely didn't want to produce forecasts that are Fibbles. Exactly. Fables are much better than fibbles. Okay, so hopefully you've seen and been able to follow along with uh, estimating an ETS model uh, on the PVS A10 dataset. And hopefully you can see the uh, forecast look reasonable here as well. Okay, any questions for how exponential smoothing works? I guess it might be useful if I looked at the components while some questions come in. So these time varying coefficients can actually be pulled out from the model, just like you can look at the uh, coefficients of a regression model. In this case, the coefficients of the ETS model change over time. So you can see my intercept here, the level, is increasing with time, just like the data is increasing. But the slope is also changing. There's times when the slope is uh, increasing at about 1,000 uh, scripts per month, where the forecast is quite flat. But there's also this time when the rate of change, the trend, gets stronger. So you can see the slope becomes steeper here. And then it starts decreasing the slope. So it flattens out again. And then it is a bit more volatile towards the end. So you can see how the trend coefficient, the slope, is changing over time. You can also look a little bit about the seasonality and see that it's changing amplitude a little bit and that the random component looks random as well. And yes, this output is very similar to decomposition, um, STL output. And the STL output in R also produces this type of plot. And since we're talking about the data names, a uh, decomposition table is a table. That one's perhaps the worst name of the lot. OK, there were a few questions here. Uh, sorry if you didn't catch this. Uh, do they work with repeated mi measures mixed effect class of models? Uh, they could, but we don't yet have mixed effects time series models implemented. Uh, there's nothing stopping time series being used with mixed effects models. We just haven't, no one's created that function for time series yet. Now, if you work very similarly to regression, where we had the linear trend and linear seasonality, you can just add those variables in for mixed effects models. Uh, another question, can models in the package uh, apply to non-Gaussian response variables, small counts, for example? Uh, they can. We've got a fable.ts count package. Uh, so you can install this. It's only on GitHub, so you have to search for, around for it. Um, but this produces uh, Poisson and zero inflated uh, gamma distributions, I think it is, for your small count data sets. Um, we'll also see in the next model, the ARIMA model, how we can produce log normal distributions from our forecasts. OK, so did this ETS model match the patterns that we saw in the plot? The automatic model was MAM. And sure enough, uh, we could see the multiplicative seasonal pattern, how it was growing in size, growing in amplitude with the level, and also how the error was increasing variability as well. So this is a good model that was automatically selected. OK, to understand a REMA, which I don't expect we, us to be able to understand in just 10 minutes, uh, but to do our best. Unlike 
The other models, like the seasonal naive, which directly copied the seasonal pattern, or the ETS model, or the regression model, which used dummy variables, or time varying dummy variables, in order to capture the seasonality, these models directly described the trend and the seasonality. ARIMA doesn't do this, it instead uses autocorrelations. So if you're intimidated by the ACF plot, um, I apologize, it's back. Uh, the ARIMA model works directly on this ACF. Uh, you can think of it like that. And this is uh, possible because the ACF contains all of the relevant information. We see the seasonality in this peak. We saw the trend in the slow decay. And we also saw things in the ACF that we couldn't see in the other plots so easily, like cyclical patterns. And ARIMA can handle cycles where the other models can't. But fortunately for, uh, well, before I get into that, um, unlike the ETS model, ARIMA is strictly additive. It can't handle multiplicative patterns. And that might immediately seem pretty useless because I talked about how most patterns in time series data had this multiplicative seasonal shape. But we have a trick. It's not a problem for us. We can use transformations. How would I convert a multiplicative relationship? So maybe I had my, uh, my level times my seasonality. How would I convert this into an additive relationship? That's exactly right. We can bring in the logarithm or power transformations more generally. So if you remember your algebra class, we can use logarithms to convert multiplicative relationships into additive ones. And therefore we can still use ARIMA models when we have uh, multiplicative data. But in order to do this, we first need to transform our data using a log to make it additive. Okay, so let's have a look at this data set again. PBS scripts. Uh, that wasn't a great one. Let's look at PBS A10. This one looks a bit too additive. Okay, so we could see that we have a small seasonal amplitude here and a larger one here. This is a multiplicative relationship. The level is multiplied by the seasonality. Now, look how nice this turns out if I just add a log transformation. Log transforming the data, now the amplitude is more similar. So it's converted a multiplicative pattern into an additive one. Now, technically a log is a little bit too strong here. Um, it's getting a bit too small at the end. Um, we can use power transformations. They're known as Box-Cox transformations or Year johnson transformations, um, depending on what you prefer to use, uh, to fine tune this and get the uh, best possible constant variance in the data. But for today, log will be enough. Now, just like ETS, we have an automatic method for choosing the parameters, the hyperparameters of an ARIMA model. Um, if you've done any forecasting before, you would have seen this known as the order ARIMA method. It's a very widely used uh, algorithm for benchmarking and even forecasting uh, still today. And just like for ETS, if we don't specify on the right-hand side uh, any parameters, it will be automatically selected. All that we need to do is say if we need a log transformation or not. And here's some extra details about some other transformations that you might like to use uh, if the log isn't quite right for your needs. So for this data set, PBS A10, we can estimate an ARIMA model on this data, but we need to use the log of scripts instead of just scripts. I'll just save this as an intermediate object so we can look at it. And you can see it's chosen uh, some extra parameters for the ARIMA model and the seasonal part. Uh, we don't have the time uh, to worry about this today, but we can use our same technique to evaluate it just by looking at how it looks.
These correspond to the lags of the ACF and the PACF. Okay, so based on just the autocorrelations without directly capturing trend and seasonality, um, just looking at how it relates to past observations of itself, we can capture the trend, seasonality, all of the fine details, and it looks like a fairly reasonable forecast. Again, like we've done before, we'll exaggerate this by forecasting further into the future. And that looks like some very reasonable forecasts. You can see, especially here, forecasting 10 years ahead, how the uncertainty is growing exponentially over time. The further ahead we forecast, the less confident we are about what the future will hold. Ah, yes, good point. Um, some of the uh, model order selection here, like the automatic differences, uh, requires the ERCA package. Uh, it does some statistical tests from ERCA in order to automatically select that. Yeah, um, very briefly, there's a question about how the automatic method works. It uses the log likelihood, and more specifically, it uses Akiiki's information criterion, AICC, corrected version, and it just tries to minimize that number. So it chooses lots of models and picks the one which has the lowest um, AICC. And estimate, yeah, so the process for estimating a REMA model is just step one, look at the data and see if you need to transform it to make it additive. If you've got any multiplicative patterns, you'll need to log the data or box box transform it. And then you can use the automatic model selection in order to choose an appropriate model. It tends to work really well. And that's why the auto ARIMA model is quite famous in the forecasting world. And then lastly, uh, let's compare the pair, ARIMA and ETS. Often people make this comparison because they're two very good models. Oh, also notice how we've forecasted the log of scripts, but my forecasts are on the scripts data. So let me go back a step actually. You'll see my normal distribution here is no longer just normal. The mean is only 13, but my forecasts are on the order of 500,000. And that's because I've got a transformed normal distribution. The transformation here is the uh, inverse of the log transformation that I've done here, the exponential. And therefore what I have here is actually a log normal distribution, a skewed distribution. So uh, the right tail of this distribution is a lot longer than the left tail. It's skewed, positively skewed. Comparing that with an ETS model, which didn't have any transformations because it could directly handle multiplicative patterns. If I just forecast one step ahead temporarily, you can see the ETS model produced directly the normal distribution, whereas the log of the data produced a uh, log normal distribution, a transformed normal distribution. So I'm now going to plot both ETS and ARIMA on top of each other. I've estimated a model with both of them, produced forecasts 10 years ahead from both of them. And now I'm plotting them with only the 80% interval to reduce overplotting. In fact, I can also add some transparency here so that it's a bit easier to see the both models, the forecast from both models. Perhaps a bit too transparent. But you can see, especially in the short-term horizon, both of these forecasts are very confident and very similar. So there's only very slight differences between the two. But forecasting further ahead, the ARIMA forecasts are slightly uh, above the ETS forecasts, and the means especially are above, but that's mostly due to the uh, skewed distribution from the log normal distribution. So that transformation is producing this exponential trend where the ETS is not exponential. Okay, so in summary, ETS and ARIMA, very hotly debated which one is best. And the answer, like most things, it depends. And what does it depend on? It depends on the data. 
So if you've got different patterns, if you had, uh, say, cyclical patterns, then an ARIMA might forecast that pattern better because it can directly work with cycles, whereas ETS can't. ETS might be better at handling multiplicative patterns. For the ARIMA forecasts, you need to log transform them before being able to estimate the model. But both of them tend to do quite well for trends and seasonalities. Um, we're not going to do Bayesian in this workshop, but it is something that's commonly done for forecasting. Um, there's a Bayesian structural models uh, package, which can work for time series as well. Uh, but there's not much support for Bayesian in this tidy forecasting workflow yet. Okay, we're going to take another five minute break. And after the break, we're going to look at how to choose the best model. How do we numerically summarize uh, which forecast is better than the other one based on errors and accuracy? And this will enable us to choose the best forecast uh, based on many models. So if you had any unrelated questions or related questions, any questions at all, feel free to ask and we'll uh, start again at 50, five minutes to the next hour. Okay, if you're looking for something to do, feel free to rest and stretch and get up and walk around. Um, or you can also uh, try estimating some models. So one suggestion would be to try this out on the simple US accidental deaths data set again. So looking at this data set, what patterns does it have? Is it additive or multiplicative? How do the ARIMA and ETS models compare for this data set? Um, that would be a good uh, opportunity, good example to practice on. Okay, another question, why do we choose a Bayesian, method, Bayesian method for forecasting? Um, there's a few reasons why you might prefer a Bayesian method for forecasting. Um, it's especially relevant when you want to incorporate informative priors rather than uninformative priors. Uh, if you had some expert judgment or some uh, strong opinions for how the future might be or what the model might be, you could use that. Um, but Often it's more of an ideological difference. Uh, with the COVID forecasting that I do, uh, there's some teams that use more Bayesian approaches and agent-based models. And I used a fairly simple statistical model, very similar to the ARIMA model that we just saw. And it performed just as well, if not often better than uh, the other epidemiological models that it was being compared with. And those epidemiological models were developed with the Bayesian frameworks. Um, Peter asks, any recommendations for tourists coming to Australia first time September 2024 in Adelaide? Could be a little cold at that time of year, especially in Adelaide. Adelaide tends to be a little bit colder. Um, are you going anywhere else than Adelaide? Adelaide's a fairly small city. Yeah, plenty to see on the East Coast. Um, definitely check out some beaches. Um, there's a lot of, uh, if you're coming to Melbourne, where I'm from, uh, there's quite a lot of art and, um, and trams and uh, great city views. Uh, but probably the best in Australia, you can't go past the wildlife and the nature. It's just such a unique climate and uh, ecosystem that we have here. And pretty much everywhere across Australia, you can see a lot of the Australian animals. Yeah, it surprises me how um, the rainbow lorikeets, all the parrots, all the exotic birds that we have here um, are often considered pests. They're just really noisy. 
whereas they're such prized birds and uh, famous birds around the world. We have hundreds um, flying over our house every now and then. They're beautiful rainbow lorikeets, but they're very noisy and messy as well. Okay, time to get back to it. Oops, I should have rendered this while I was waiting. Oh, that's not a good sign. That's where all my pipes have been going. I was wondering why my shortcut wasn't working. Let's hope that hasn't broken too much of my slides. Okay, while this is rendering, there's another question. Rather than numerical diagnostics, plots are more important for decision making using which model to use for forecasting. Um, yes, I, I, I agree. Um, often people use numerical summaries that we'll look at today uh, in this last session. Uh, but I think it's better to look at plots of the errors in different ways to see which uh, where the models are underperforming or performing well. And that can help you better understand uh, the accuracy of the forecast and where it might be biased in one way or another. Um, but for a quick comparison on lots of different time series and lots of different models, it's often a lot easier to just produce a one number summary of the overall performance. Oh, you're making me hungry with those pretzels. <laughs> All right, let's go. So accuracy evaluation, how do we evaluate uh, time series models to see which one is the most suitable for forecasting. So just like any regression, uh, accurate models have small errors, but as we saw before, accurate models aren't necessarily the only thing that makes them good. A good model should capture all of the patterns that we saw in the past. So it would be clearly a bad model if your data was seasonal and you didn't forecast any seasonality. But that's different from an accurate model uh, you hope that it's accurate, but there's some things that you don't account for, like the pandemic, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad model. So the model errors are what's left over from the model. It's containing any patterns that weren't in the model itself. So if you had a model that captured trend, but the data had trend and seasonality, you'll find that the errors from the model still have that seasonal pattern. Okay, so here's some code. I'm gonna put it in the chat again. Um, this is a quick start code to catch everyone up uh, if you've just joined us or if you haven't been able to follow along so far. So this creates the PBS scripts dataset and the two models that we just looked at at the end of uh, the last session. And lastly, you might have seen this function before from the broom package for cross-sectional stuff. We can also use the augment function for uh, Mabel objects as well. And this will give us a fitted variable, which is our one step ahead prediction value, residuals and innovations. And these are both errors. These are two different types of errors that have very different meaning. So this is what our augment output looks like. It's a Sybil and works exactly like an ordinary Sybil. But most relevant to us today are these two columns, residuals and innovation residuals. Uh, Resid is also known as response residuals. So our one step in sample fits, our prediction on things that we already knew is y hat t, and they're in the fitted column. We use et to denote the actual errors, that is, what actually happened minus what we forecasted would happen. And that's in the dot resid column. But there's a slight difference for epsilon t for the innovation errors. And these are the errors that the model saw. And there's a few differences here. You can see that they, they look very different here, residuals and innovation residuals. And that's because this ETS model was multiplicative errors. Remember this was an MAM model. So the model was yt equals, if I remember it, uh, lt minus one plus bt minus one, the details here don't matter, st minus m, 
1 plus epsilon t. Hopefully you can see that. Now this error, epsilon t, is this innovation. This is y hat. y hat is this fitted value, and drop resid et is your actual data minus your predicted value, your fitted value. That's simply scripts minus fitted. Now you can see the difference here, why this innovation is so small, is because it's a multiplicative error. It's got one plus this number multiplied by the level, the seasonality, everything else. That's also different for when we did our log transformation on ARIMA. The ARIMA model is only seeing the log of the data, and so the innovation residuals for ARIMA are logged, whereas the response residuals are back transformed. So response residuals are usually what we think of when we think of errors, but innovations are really useful for when we're looking for any patterns that the model didn't capture. Okay, so you probably have seen this before for cross-sectional analysis. You can plot the uh, fitted values against the actual values, but in time series, we often use time plots for this. So I've got the black line representing the actual data, and you can see the ETS and ARIMA models in uh, blue and red respectively are following that data quite closely. So these are good models following the data very well. Now, perhaps the most important thing from today, from this last session, is the accuracy function. The accuracy function calculates the one unit summary statistics, known as measures, to overall compare or summarize the performance of a model. And generally with these, we want them to be lower. Lower is the better. So you might have seen, or some of these terms might be familiar to you. Uh, if they're not, I've got a slide here summarizing them and what they mean. The ME is the mean error, and this is without any absolute or squaring or anything, so this is a good indication of bias. You can see in this model, the uh, ETS model, the mean error is positive. So ET is equal to YT minus Y hat T. And if this is always greater than zero, or on average greater than zero, that suggests that the model is under predicting the actual value. Y hat t, the predictions are always less than the actual value y t. Now the ARIMA model has the opposite problem. It's got a negative mean error. So that means it's biased in the other direction. We're over predicting y t hat is greater than y t on average. <laughs> now, these are quite small average errors, small bias. Um, hopefully, this would be zero, but this is on the scale of uh, hundreds of thousands or millions. So we're off by 10,000 with some bias. It could be a problem that we want to improve upon with our model. Now, the other summary statistics here are ways of reducing the overall performance of the model, not just bias in one aspect of the performance, but the overall accuracy of the model. And some common ones that you probably have heard of before, root mean squared error. You square the error, take the average, and then square root it. And this is a way of calculating the accuracy of the forecast mean, which is the most common thing that you'd plot with that line. Notice that these are all point forecast accuracy measures. There's other ones for evaluating the accuracy of intervals and, in fact, entire distributions, uh, but we don't have the time for it in just three hours. Now, another common one that you probably have seen in cross-sectional stuff, uh, the mean absolute error, is a way of evaluating the median of the forecast distribution and how accurate that median is. Now, it's very popular, I suppose, to use percentage errors, mean percentage error, mean absolute percentage error, uh, but these are problematic, and you can read the textbook that I'll link at the end of these slides uh, for more information why they're problematic. Uh, they don't have meaningful zeros. Uh, you can possibly divide by zero. There's all sorts of scaling-related problems with these. But percentage errors are a useful way, a useful attempt, I, sh I could say, to compare accuracy in different time series. If I was forecasting, say, temperature in Celsius, 
and I got it wrong by two degrees Celsius, that's okay, right? It's not terrible. But if I got temperature wrong by 200,000 degrees Celsius, my forecast must be horrendous. As opposed to uh, the budget for a pharmaceutical benefit scheme, if I was wrong by 200,000 Australian dollars, that's nothing. That's a very accurate forecast. So depending on the scale of what you're forecasting, uh, the accuracy will differ or the, these metrics will differ. So one attempt is to say percentage errors. Maybe I was wrong on temperature by 5%, and that's more comparable to being wrong on the uh, budget for uh, subsidies of drugs in Australia by 5% as well. But a far better way to compare time series is to use a scaled error. And rather than dividing by the uh, response variable, yt, we instead divide by the error from a different model, one of our benchmarks. And this removes all of the problems with dividing by zero and uh, by having a meaningful zero. It's just much better to use MACE where possible. And just like MAE, there's a root mean squared scaled error version for this as well. So looking at these accuracy, st accuracy statistics, we want to find the model which has the lowest uh, errors. And you can see looking at say, mean absolute scaled error, we find that the ARIMA model had the lowest mean absolute scale error. So for the median forecasts, the ARIMA model was better. But notice the root mean squared scaled error is better for the ETS model. And that suggests that the mean forecast from the ETS model was better. Because these are conflicting, it just means that both of these models are great or equally bad. They're very similar models in terms of their forecasting accuracy. Any questions with accuracy summary statistics or measures? Okay, um, notice that this says, if I had it expanded more, this says training errors. I'll bring this into R so we can see this better. So we have training errors here. This means that they're in-sample predictions, in-sample errors. And this is a bit problematic because these models have kind of seen the future, they've cheated. They've optimized uh, the forecast based on future values, and then it's kind of checking its answers based on stuff it already knew. So these aren't very realistic for what you can expect the forecasting accuracy to be, forecasting things that you haven't seen before. In general, the training errors are gonna be smaller than the test set out of sample forecast errors. Now, there's another question. Would you consider an ensemble of these two models and their biases in different directions? In this case, the bias isn't so uh, large and not very concerning, uh, but uh, ensemble between ETS and ARIMA is a very, very common model to do. And it's a very highly performing model. You get the advantages of ARIMA for handling cyclical patterns and handling, handling a wider range of additive patterns whereas ETS can handle multiplicative patterns. So an ensemble of the two are very effective. Uh, but that's out of the scope of this uh, workshop. So the problem with uh, model accuracy, with these accuracy measures, is that they've kind of seen the future and they're cheating a little bit in their optimal parameters. A more realistic way of evaluating forecast accuracy is to produce a forecast and see how accurate it was. So I might produce, have some data, and I make some forecasts, and now I have to wait. All right, this is the end of time, and I've made my forecast for two years in the future, and now I have to wait for two years to see if I was right or wrong. That's not very effective. That would be a very uh, tedious and time consuming way of evaluating our forecasts. Instead, we just pretend that we haven't seen the most recent year of data or the most recent two years of data. And instead of forecasting into the future that we haven't seen, we produce forecasts for what we have seen without letting the model see it, without looking at it too much. And then we can immediately evaluate if our forecasts were accurate or not. 
So the process is to create a training data set withholding some data from the end to evaluate the forecasting accuracy. And then we produce forecasts that overlap with that held out test. And here's some code that uh, does this. The only difference from what I had before is this line here. So I've still got my data set. I model it with ETS and ARIMA, and I produce some forecasts. But this time, I'm keeping some data uh, from the model so that I can compare it later on. So I put this one in the chat as well. Uh, feel free to put this in R and try it out for yourself. And while that's running, you can see this is our entire data set. My filter function is obtained just this blue section of the data. So I'm keeping on some black uh, final few years in order to evaluate my forecasting accuracy. And then using the code I've just put in the chat, we're producing two years of forecast. And you can see immediately if we were accurate or not, just by this plot. And you can see our forecasts are pretty closely aligned with the actual data that the models had not seen. So here's my forecast from my two models. And then to evaluate the accuracy of these models, we can again use the accuracy function, just like we did for the fitted values, the Mabel, but this time we're passing in the fable, the forecasts. So if I do accuracy of my forecasts, you can see I need to specify the future data. Again, just like when plotting, the forecasts don't know anything about the past, the present, or the future. They just contain predictions. So in order to compare how accurate these forecasts were, we need to provide the actual data set, PBS scripts. And now you can see uh, the accuracy for those forecasts summarized down into single numbers. And it appears that for all accuracy measures, the ARIMA model had a lower uh, RMSE, mean absolute error, MACE, RMSSE, uh, so for this test set, the ARIMA model outperformed the ETS model. The forecasts from ARIMA were more accurate. Notice also that the type of this test is now a test set. Type of this accuracy is a test set, meaning that the model hasn't cheated. It hasn't seen the future. And this is a genuine evaluation of forecast accuracy. So. A reminder, you have to include the data when evaluating future performance, forecasting accuracy. But your interpretations of these measures are all the same. Any questions with that? Great. So what's the problem with a test set? In Lots of situations in the cross-sectional world, it's very common to do cross-validation or um, even before that you have a holdout set, but that's randomly sampled throughout the entire data set. So it's pretty representative of all of the patterns in the data. You might keep 80% for training the model and leave 20% for evaluation. And that 20% is spread throughout all of the data. But there's a problem here with the test set in time series. We can't randomly just remove observations we can only remove them from the end of the data because we have the temporal correlation, temporal structure. And therefore, this final two years of data may not be representative of the patterns that we saw in the past. Remember the COVID tourism example, for example. And the accuracy of that test set would be horrendous and it wouldn't be very useful for evaluating if ARIMA was better than ETS or vice versa. So, we're going to have to skip this uh, exercise, but I encourage you to try it out yourself, essentially following the same steps for the A10 example. But we essentially have this small sample size problem for time series evaluation, forecast evaluation. And it's more problematic than that in that the small sample is not representative of all of the data. It's only representative of the most recent data. It's not so bad because we care more about the recent data than the past data for forecasting. Uh, but it is very sensitive because all of our evaluation is based on just two years of data. 
So here's the example for COVID forecasting. My test set accuracy here would have been really poor. Now there's a solution for this and just like you can improve your accuracy evaluation for cross-sectional using cross-validation, we can use time series cross-validation, which is slightly different. This allows us to create many different starting points, many different training data sets, and produce many different forecasts from different places. So in blue, I've got the data that I've fitted a model for, and then I'm producing a forecast in orange. And notice that rather than just forecasting the last few observations, I can now produce much more forecasts for more areas of the data set. So I get a little bit more, a lot more diversity in the patterns that exist in the data. And the way we do this is using the stretch Sybil function. So just like before to do uh, a test set, we added this filter line to make a cross-validated test set or cross-validated training data. We add another line for cross-validation, stretch Sybil. Uh, we have the number of observations that we're going to increase our folds of cross-validation by and the initial size, the minimum size of the fold. Um, probably a bit easier to see that visually. Here's our time series, the original data. Now, instead of just a single test set, a uh, single training set that I had in blue before, I've now split it up into six different training sets, starting with four years of data, 48 months in purple or pink, then that will produce forecasts from there. And then we add in two more years of data and we forecast from the start to the end of the blue and repeat. So we are able to forecast almost the entirety of the data set using genuine forecasts and evaluate the forecasting accuracy across all of time. So here's some forecasts, cross-validated forecasts from those different starting points. It looks a bit like a mess, but uh, you can see at the start, the ETS model was far more confident than the ARIMA model, but towards the, towards the end, when there was more data for supporting the ARIMA model, it got a bit more confident. And this allows you to do much more uh, in-depth analysis on how these models perform. Maybe ETS can perform better with smaller time series, shorter time series, whereas ARIMA is better for longer time series. You might find that for your data by using this process. But with this cross-validated accuracy, once again, finally, we use the accuracy function and we get our single unit summaries of forecasting performance. So I'm going to copy that code and show you that in R. Put that in the chat again. So the only difference here between the last example and this example is stretch Sybil. It's very modular. We switch between these plots uh, quickly. And the plot code for those plots um, we'll look at once we're done. It's, um, there is some quick plot code, but it's a little convoluted. So this will take a little bit of time because now we're producing uh, six different forecast time points for two different models. And these are being automatically selected. So it's more like a hundred models for each thing being estimated here to pick the best one. So it'll churn through probably about 600 models here and uh, we'll give it some time. The downside of cross-validation, of course, is it takes longer to compute, but it's always more accurate, more representative than uh, regular test set accuracy. Give it a second. And then just like we produced accuracy for our out of sample forecasts, our cross validated forecasts are also out of sample. So we use the exact same code as the last example with Fable. I will answer off topic questions at the end. Okay, so that's finished now. Uh, you can see my cross validated forecasts now have this extra column for the ID. This is the fold of the cross validation. I have my models, ETS, and further down you'll find ARIMA, and then the distributions that we're going to evaluate. Calculating those one unit accuracy summary statistics once more. Here, just like we saw before, the ARIMA model is more accurate than ETS. It's got lower uh, RMSE, mean absolute error, uh, MACE, RMSSE, 
it's better on all accuracy measures. So based on this analysis, I would much prefer to use the ARIMA model for forecasting. Okay, I don't know if I've got till uh, five more minutes or 10 more minutes. I'm gonna assume I've got 10 minutes. Because I don't think there's anyone here to tell me not. Oh, Peter is here, I couldn't see you in the chat. Excellent, 10 more minutes. Okay, so this is all about evaluating accuracy with one number summaries of performance, but we talked about how uh, that's not really telling the whole story. Reducing the overall performance of a model just down to one number can't possibly tell you why the model's good or bad. And for this, we can use residual diagnostics. So once again, we go back to the augment output, but this time we'll be looking at the model residuals or the innovations, and they're stored in the dot .inov column. So I mentioned this at the start, innovation residuals contain everything that the model didn't capture. So if the model didn't capture trend, the innovation residuals would have trend in it. And we can use all the same techniques that we saw in the first hour, plotting the data, to try and look for these patterns. Except rather than hoping we see something interesting, now we're hoping to see nothing. We're hoping that the model has captured all of the information so that there's nothing left over in my residuals. Now these innovation residuals aren't very useful for calculating accuracy, since they might be transformed or multiplicative or manipulated in some way, but they are important for testing the assumptions that we have for the models. So here's the big idea. We take these residuals, we visualize them to look for patterns and hope we don't find any. If we don't find any patterns, that means our model has captured all of the patterns in the data. If we do find patterns, now we know that the model hasn't captured that pattern, hasn't captured that seasonality. And so we might think to add seasonality into our model therefore improving our model and improving our forecasts. Okay, uh, somehow I skipped a slide. Okay, let me show you this one. I pu I'll put it in the chat, but I'll work through this one interactively. Okay, this is the data set that we've been looking at throughout the day. Clearly this data set has trend. And so we've captured that with my regression model. I've added a trend to a model, but I've forgotten to add my seasonality. Maybe I didn't see it in this data. Maybe I just thought it was random variation. So I estimate my model and I can then look at my residuals. So augment my model and then maybe auto plot my innovations. I might look at this and see, hmm, that looks a bit suspect. Maybe I have some seasonality here. And I, I'll have a closer look using the GG season function. Aha, uh -huh. we've detected a bit of a problem with our model. So you can see clearly the big drop in February and the increase in January. There's still a lot of pattern left over in my residuals that my model wasn't able to capture. If I add my seasonality into this model, fixing this uh, mistake, plotting my innovations with a time plot, you can see it looks a bit more random. Maybe there's some cyclical patterns here or time, maybe the trend isn't linear and an ETS model would be better. If I look at the season plot, you can see it's now much more random. I've captured the seasonality in my regression model by adding it to the model. And my residual diagnostics reveal to me that the seasonality has been captured adequately. Now, this is also a really powerful technique at visualization. And this is kind of a poor man's way of um, doing decomposition. Um, in the textbook that I'll link to at the end, uh, you can have better methods for decomposing the seasonality. But here the seasonality is really clear. You can see that the trough is definitely in February, peak is definitely in January. Comparing that with the original data, when I did a season plot, this 
season plot on the original data was a bit harder to look at because we had the trend. So a neat trick is to use a model to remove the trend, capture it, and then whatever's left over, hopefully just the seasonality, will give you a much clearer plot of the seasonal pattern. This will be much better to include in a report than uh, the direct season plot. Much clearer indication of the seasonality. And this is an idea called decomposition. Uh, STL models are commonly used for this, and you can read the textbook for more information on that. But modeling is a powerful tool in the loop of visualization and data exploration. Okay, so clearly from the innovation residuals, we could see some seasonality. And so uh, because it's still in the residuals, we should improve our model and capture that. So to finish up, uh, yes, to finish up, we're going to look for any patterns in our PBS model. So here's some code to get us started. Um, I'll leave the innovation residual question until the end as well, just for interest of time. So now I've pulled out my augmented values, residuals and innovations, and now I might go looking uh, into these values to see any patterns. Is there any signal, any heteroscedasticity, any information I can see in the time plot? Not really, it looks pretty random from these two models. What about a season plot? Also looks pretty random. So far, these models look pretty good. Of course, there are other visualizations that you would consider looking at, uh, but this same idea uh, applies. So we can see that these models have captured the seasonality quite well and captured the trend quite well by looking at the auto plot. No trend in this data. Now, the main purpose or the main use of residual diagnostics is to check the assumptions of the model. And so far, we haven't written this down, but all of the models we've seen today assume that the errors, these are the innovation residuals from the model, are IID, independent and identically distributed, with normal mean, zero, and variance sigma squared, constant mean and constant variance. And we've got a helpful function that you can use to check these assumptions called GGTS residuals. Uh, but you have to do one model at a time. So let's have a look at that. Let's start with the ETS model. And we can go through our assumptions and this will be the last thing we do. So epsilon t is iid normal zero sigma squared. So you can look at these assumptions. Is it normally distributed? Where would we look for that? We have a histogram that I'm somewhat blocking and I won't be able to get away from it because I'm being tracked. Looks a little bit skewed. Um, maybe I can drop down a bit. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't win this battle with my camera. Uh, but it looks mostly normally distributed. It's fairly symmetric. It's got a single mode. Uh, I can tick this off. It looks normally distributed. Oh, that's excellent. Thanks for putting that in the chat. Oops. So the normal distribution gets a tick of approval. How would I check the identical assumption? We're hoping that the mean is always zero and the variance is always sigma squared. So here we can see from the time plot that the, the his the innovation residuals are centered around zero. So the average of this, all of these innovation residuals are mean zero. And so that gets a tick of approval. What about sigma squared? Is the variance consistent? Well, for that, we're looking for heteroscedasticity. Pretty constant variance. I'm happy with that. That gets a tick of approval. So we've checked our independent, um, sorry, we've checked our identical, our distribution, zero sigma squared, all we're missing is the middle I, independent. 
So how do we check for independence? That means that epsilon t is not related to epsilon t minus 1, epsilon t minus 2, and all of those things, all those lags. And the ACF, the autocorrelation, helps us see independence. And remember from the first session, when I talked about these blue dashed lines, if they're outside the blue dashed line, then there's a significant uh, autocorrelation. There's some pattern, some information. And this is a 95% by default test. There's a formal test as well that the textbook goes into, but this is a rough idea. And you can see that there's not really any lines substantially out of this uh, blue dashed region. There are a couple, but they're only just outside the line. And this one's so far back in the past that I don't care about it. It's only these first two that I'm a little concerned about, but they're close enough. So I would give the independence assumption a tick of approval as well. You can, of course, use the formal test that's in the textbook. Uh, it's a long box test. So with these residual diagnostics, by plotting the distribution of the errors in different ways, we can check our assumptions, we can look for any patterns that exist in the data, and we can uh, see if we've done everything we can to produce good forecasts. Uh, the same thing for ARIMA, we'll show that the ACF looks even better, the histogram looks more normally distributed, uh, so that's partly why the ARIMA model performed better in the accuracy statistics. Okay, I'm going to finish it up here. That's all we have time for. So thank you all for joining me. You can learn more about forecasting uh, with the Forecasting Principles and Practices textbook. It's freely available online. You can just search FPP3 or click this link. Um, I appreciate your feedback. I put a link in here, um, but I hear that there might be other feedback going around. So um, I encourage you to fill out either of those. Um, both I will read and uh, treasure. Uh, you can also click the feedback link at the top of the website here. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a lovely day, good night, wherever you might be, and I uh, hope you learned something. And I'll stick around and answer the remaining questions, but I'll end the recording here. Thank you everyone.